our story, if you're uh, visiting or just checking out the church, we uh, started with a prayer gathering just about six years ago. Six years ago on September the 11th was our first chance to even talk about what would be a new church plant. And then about five and a half years ago on Easter, we began weekly gathering like this and organizing ourselves in homes all around the city with what we call 26 West Communities. And so we're just a few years in, but what we realize is because every year there are new people to the community and every year there are people who move away. So we decided early on that every fall, because our calendar, if you're a parent, you know your real calendar isn't January through December. Your real calendar is the school calendar where, where everything in life is dictated by some email, by some teacher. And because the school calendar is like the rhythm for family life, that every fall we would pause, and most of the time we've done a series to reorient ourselves to what we're called to be as a church and invite you to join in. And the next year, if God keeps you here, here's where we're headed. Um, wh what are we about? Uh, this may seem obvious if you've gone on our website. On the front page is a phrase, helping people experience life in Jesus. Helping people experience life in Jesus is the driving phrase. It's, it's what we're about. It's how we make decisions. We realize we're not here as a church for us only. God loves us, but he, he loves our city, and he loves our state, and he loves our country, and he loves our world. So why join a church? Because we believe together we'll be better at helping other people. That's why we're here. Not just helping people, but helping people experience life. We're existing, we're moving, we're paying bills a lot of us, you know, and we're struggling with it. We have ups and downs, but are we experiencing life to the full? Well, we have discovered, many of us here, that in Jesus, we can reorient our lives to help people, and in helping people, we'll experience life. So this is a phrase that we've gone through in the fall. We've taken three weeks. We've taken seven weeks to kind of break it down. Today, instead, though, just where we are as a church we're not going to do a vision series. We're going to do a vision Sunday, and that happens to be today. Where, what are we doing well? Where do we have room to grow? And what do we want to focus on as a church in this coming season of our life? Today, we just want to look at the big picture. And rather than a series and then go on, it just so happens that we're in Romans. And we ended, if you're with us, in the spring before our summer break with Romans 11. And we're picking up today in Romans 12. And as I read it this summer, just been praying about you and my life. And God, what are you doing? I don't know. I want to know what you're doing. The more I read Romans 12, the more I realized, rather than a vision series, let's just read the text. And we're going to see in God, he's given us a great vision of how to help people experience life in Jesus. So today's going to be big picture. If you've been here since day one, some of it's going to be review. But hopefully we'll leave on the same page and then we'll, we'll pick it up and we'll look at Romans 12 in detail starting next Sunday. Does that make sense? Okay, nod, because that's what we're doing anyway. Okay, Romans 12, 1 through 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Now, I'm going to teach on these two verses over the next two weeks because some have suggested, and I think they might be right, that the entirety of the Christian life could be summarized in what we just read. Everything that God is driving us towards, everything he's longing to do in our soul can be summarized. And that's not everything God has said, but could be summarized in living out these two verses. So we're going to go super slow and then we'll, we'll speed up uh, a little bit along the way. But today I want to look at the beginning of the phrase, therefore I urge you. That's what we're going to look at this morning and kind of catch us up on what God's doing as a church. Therefore I urge you is a short phrase, phrase, if you've read all of Romans, that pivots, it turns it. Uh, you could divide Romans into two parts. We've divided it into subcategories. You could say it's in two parts. Romans chapters 1 through 11, what the good news of Jesus is. What is it? 
What has God done in Jesus? How does it affect us? Romans 12 then through 16 is how we live out this good news together. And everything, no exaggeration, hinges on what he said about the good news of Jesus, what it is, and then therefore in light of all that God has done in Jesus, I am now pleading with you. You could translate it. Another translation says, I appeal to you. Uh, another older translation, I exhort you, if there are any exhorters here, you're like, I don't even know exactly what that is, but appealing, pleading, exhorting, begging. Guys, ladies, like this is really important. I want you to get this. And this next season of our life as a church, this fall, looking into Christmas and beyond, I pray it is a hinge, a pivot on how you and I practice our faith. So, so the question is, how do we live out the good news? How do we practice it? It's one thing to talk about it. I'm a follower of Jesus. Many would say, that's me. Uh, I love God. That's me. I, I, I have been born anew. I've been born again. That's me. I, I go to church and I'm, I'm a part of this thing. That's me. That's one thing to talk about it. But it's another thing, my friends, to think like God and his good news. And to begin to act like God and his good news, and to be someone who's a model who'd say like, man, if I wanted to know what Jesus and following him is like, all I have to do is just look at this person, this couple, this group of people. When I think about what it might mean to follow Jesus, I just want to get closer to them. Wouldn't it be exciting if that were our story? If we could say with confidence that we're not there yet, but we're growing into that kind of people. Well, how do, we, how do we turn? Because the letter turns, how do we turn? When I looked at Romans 12, I just thought of this phrase, and it's just been stirring for a while, that there is room for more. You probably saw in the title slide, Romans 12, room for more. When you read Romans 12, and I encourage you, just go home today, and not while I'm talking, that's rude, you know, pay attention. But when you go home, just read it. Just, just think about your life and just read Romans 12 as if it were a mirror. This is a reflection of who you are called to be. And I think you might say the same thing as I read it. Man, there's just room for more. And then you go on to Romans 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 of how we live out the good news, not just as a family or a people or a church, but as the people of God in a real city, in a country, in our broken world. And how we live that out with conflicts and how we live that out with the ends of the earth who have yet to hear the good news in its fullness. And you'll, you'll get a growing discomfort. If you read it honestly, you'll get a growing discomfort in your soul that says, man, I, I want to be, I'm not there yet, but there is room for more. Now room for more of what? Like that's a, that's a nice phrase, but of what? Well, as you read Romans 12, it's going to get clear, but I think three things at least this morning that could begin to frame. This is all big picture, and I'm going back to Romans 12.1 next Sunday, Lord willing. But I think three areas where we could say we have room to grow. Number one, room for more of Jesus working in us. When you, when you read Romans 12, therefore I urge you, I plead, I appeal to you in light of the mercy of God, offer yourselves, your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, altogether separate, different. doesn't mean perfect in that we never do wrong. It means set apart for something that is God's. Holy and pleasing. When we think about our lives, we want to think more like, act more like, live more like Jesus. And in order for that to happen, we're going to need more of God by his spirit, through his son, working in us. And here's the thing. We have to recognize that in you, if you're a follower of Jesus, that is your desire already. Now, I don't know you well, but I can tell you, if you are genuinely following Jesus, you've been given God's very spirit, the same spirit that animated Jesus so that he could do his work and fulfill his calling, now lives in you. If you have the Holy Spirit, your deepest inner desire is to live like Jesus and honor God with your life. But you got to recognize that you and I, we have competing desires, wouldn't, wouldn't we agree? Like, we're torn. All of us are torn. I want to stay healthy, but I want double dessert every day. <laughs> Everyone has a cheat day, I hope. 
a day where you just don't care. But when seven days are your cheat days, I want to stay healthy, but I, that's a good desire. I have in my inner deepest desire is health, and my other desire is chocolate. I want to save for the future, but the new iPhone came out or the new whatever. And so I want to save. I know that that's wise. I have that desire, but I have desire to spend. Uh, I want to thrive at work. Don't, don't you, if you, if you're in a career and you think, I, I want to do well, I want to make a difference where I work, but I also want to invest in my family and those are often in conflict. And so I, I've got competing desires. So, so room for more, hear me, room for more is not saying you got to add more to your already busy, chaotic, frantic world. Some are saying, I, I have room for less. But room for more means we're going to have to evaluate everything. We're going to have to look at what I'm already engaged in, what I'm already involved in, what I'm already pursuing in light of Romans 1 through 11, which is good news that Jesus saves mess-ups like me and says, now you can live the whole new way. And God wants you and I to live the whole new way. The most satisfying life is a life that's lived in harmony and rhythm with Jesus. There is no more satisfaction but his desires and my desires are often going to conflict. So what we're saying is we want room for more of God's presence, God's activity, God's working in and through my life. So how do I get back on track? You're like, Jose, you got me. I'm, I'm, I'm in. What do I do? Therefore, I urge you, urge you to do what? Offer yourselves. Offer your body. In other words, if we're going to make any difference this year and we're going to help people experience a life that is in Jesus, it's going to require us to be intentional. A growing faith takes intentionality. And friends, this is so base and so foundational, but it's so overlooked. I'll put it this way. Transformation requires practice. You want to be transformed in your life. It's going to require practice effort. Uh, today's, you know, football day amongst other sports. And they don't just show up on Sunday and put on the uniform and go out and rah, rah, rah. No, there's an intentionality about everything an athlete eats all week long to get ready for their important day. And if that's, if that's the kind of discipline that people are willing to have for a paycheck and a very short career, if you're in the NFL, less than three years on average, if you're willing to do that for some TV spot and a shirt, how much more to make your life count for God? And so it's going to require that you and I think about what we think about. Transformation requires, it requires practice, intentionality. So as a church, now we're saying like big picture, in the coming year, what we want to do as a, as a community is, is resource you so that you're able, those that I want to grow, that you're able to take practical tools and use them to grow in your closeness to Jesus so that there's room for more of him. So I'm going to name just a few. I'm, this is just like big picture and we can drill it down in, in the weeks to come. We've got all sorts of areas. We've got kids in middle school and high school and, and women and men. So, so let's just take kids for a second. From, from, from birth all the way through the fifth grade, uh, we flip the curriculum a bit. And now there's, what the kids are learning right now uh, there is going to be follow-up. that already has begun, but follow-up emails sent to you. So as parents, you know what verse, what thought they're thinking about, what they're memorizing, so that it's an, a simple, look, we're already chaotic, we're already frantic, but, but looking at an email and seeing what's happening could be a resource and a tool to have a dialogue with your children about what they're learning here. And so that's like one way that we can help, a, a weekly guide. Now, Pause. We can email it. The curriculum's there. But if we don't open it, if we don't look at it, if we don't think about it, if we don't carve out 10 minutes a week, maybe after a meal, do double dessert. But before dessert number two, <laughs> let's take a couple of minutes and let's read this together. Let's talk about it together. A 10-minute conversation. Again, room for more, right? We want to resource you. Middle school and high school. We have a dynamic middle school and high school. It's happening on Wednesday nights. God is moving. There, there hasn't been 
uh, worship through music, but we've added uh, Hannah and, and Ryan to our team. And so there's going to be a more engaging experience. And we have, we have small groups for them to get into, not just to hear God's truth, but to talk about it. We're not just going to talk with our own uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. Even this coming month in October is the first in our time uh, outreach. Austin Hall, one of our guys here, gifted evangelist, is going to be sharing so that students can invite other students to come in and hear the good news who maybe don't have a family where it's talked about. We want to grow. There's room for more. And so if you're a, a parent and you've got a middle schooler and a high schooler, I want you to think about and encouraging. You say, well, I don't want to go. Okay, that's, that's hard. That's hard. But in your family, I'm asking you and inviting you to ask the Spirit of God to help you to create space for your students to engage in Jesus' conversation. We have women's and men's. We, we don't have large groups with weekly meetings because we believe that life is best lived out, us all together in a house, house hashing it out. But four times a year, we have something for men and women. The ladies are about to kick off in a couple of weeks a series of four gatherings talking about women in the Bible and then leaving you, if you come to that gathering, with a, a, a series of studies that you can work through by yourself in your time with God or with a couple of other ladies. We're resourcing you. The guys are getting together for breakfast. Why? We like to eat, man. We're simple. And we have the first one for our fall coming up in just a couple of weeks. And, and we want to engage in conversation. We have guys in our church who, who are living in the real world with real, real careers and challenges, sharing, encouraging one to another over a breakfast burrito. So there are opportunities to do it. Uh, everything's better with a breakfast burrito. Let's not kid ourselves. We have studies once a month that we do here. We take topics that are relevant to what's going on in your world. We ask you, if you come to them, what should we be talking about? We want to engage and go deeper, more than we can do here on a, on a morning gathering where you're not asking questions. And we provide those every month for you. The next one that's coming up is Intentional uh, Parents Conference coming up in early November. It's an opportunity for you if you have kids in the house or want to someday to grow in learning parenting skills. We have podcasts, audio that we've done. And as of today, this is being recorded. And in the next couple of weeks, it will be posted and we'll start a weekly video podcast to help you engage. Again, all these, I'm just throwing out, these are just big picture things that we want to do to resource you. But let me be clear. Meetings and programs do not grow people. They're tools. They're resources. They could be helpful. Now, if they're ignored, they're not going to do any good. But they can be tools. It starts with desire. Let me ask you, do you want to grow? If you really want to grow as a community, we want to help you. But therefore, I urge you. I can plead with you, but it takes your effort. You have the Holy Spirit. You can. Your deepest desire is to grow, but you're going to have to fight that competing desire. Uh, bottom line, commit to personal growth this year. And as a community, if we all commit to personal growth we can encourage each other. And maybe one year from now, when you look back at this, this 2017 fall into 2018, you may see yourself thinking more like Jesus. That's just the goal. Thinking more like Jesus than you did today. Therefore, I urge you. Well, the second thing that kind of goes along with it is room for more of Jesus working through us. So, so room, room for more of Jesus working in us. We want to grow, but room for more of Jesus working through us, growth, friends, it doesn't happen on an island. I know it's a bit of an old movie. Remember that Tom Hanks movie, Castaway? You know, he's, he's working for FedEx and he gets in a, in a plane, crash lands on, on an island, and there he finds himself alone with his, his little ball, Wilson. You know, the little, little volleyball, little Wilson. And let me just ask you if you saw the movie. Did Tom Hanks grow as he was alone on that island? You see it physically, he shriveled into nothing. I said, wow, what a metaphor. He didn't grow on the island. Did he thrive on the island? He was talking to his volleyball for a long time. He didn't thrive. And so it's a metaphor for life in God together. We're going to commit ourselves. Therefore, I urge you, by the way, Paul does not write the letter to a person in the church. He writes the letter to the community, assuming 
growth in Jesus is going to happen together. And so we're calling you that there's room in our, again, already jam-packed world for more of each other. Do you want Jesus to work through you for the good of others this year? You see, Jesus wants to transform us in Romans 12. We don't need a series. Romans 12 is going to show us, and it's going to get in our face very fast, a.k.a. next week about what it means to become a person who's being transformed so that others grow. If my goal is your growth and your goal is my growth, we all benefit. But as long as my goal is me and it ends there, my friends, we're stuck on the island with our volleyball and we're wondering why we are wasting away and why Jesus seems so distant and why following seems so impossible Can I just suggest to you that growth, it happens. Yes, me and Jesus, but also we and Jesus. Who are you going to call this year when you need prayer? When something happens this week, who are you going to call? Now, there's nothing wrong with calling us as a staff and a pastoral team, an elder team here at the church. There's nothing wrong. We are here for you 100%. But if I don't even know your name, How can I make the dramatic impact that you need right now? Who are you going to call? See, those are your people. Those are your friends. Those are your men and women. Who are you going to meet with when you face life's next challenge? We all need people around us. Who are you going to share a meal with? Who are you going to do highs and lows with? Who are you going to learn from? Who are you going to rejoice with? Who are you going to help? Who who are you going to build up? Every one of us, when we think of the size of this room, it's impossible to have sustainable growth together only. There has to be one, two, five, ten other people. And, and, and let me tell you up front, you already know it, that the greatest driving force in American culture is not money. It is time. People are willing to take a pay cut if they can get more of their time back. And so the, 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 the thing that we're facing, our inner desires to grow together, but we're facing competing desires, and the competing desires is to fulfill fill my calendar, fill my time with things that are good and maybe life-giving but are not best. So I'm asking you and inviting you, room for more of God working through us means allowing margin in your world for others. Here's why. They matter to Jesus. And, And you may not get anything out of it. And you may not, like, benefit from it. But what if we actually left room in our week for one or two or five other people in this church, how how much more would our needs be met and we grow in in joy? In the coming year, I'm asking you to have room for more. Now, we want to do this together on the weekend and we want to do this together throughout the week. So let me just throw a couple of things. Uh, We want to grow in prayer together and we want to grow in community life and life on life together and we want to we grow in these ways. And, and, and this is what we're doing as a church, prayer together. Something happens when you get in a room of people and we point our attention to Jesus. And it's, I can't explain it fully, but there's nothing like it. So we want to grow. We've done morning prayer a couple of minutes before the gathering. We realize that's not enough. So those of you who come at 9, just to let you know what's happening, if you come at 9, at 8 o'clock, we're going to open up our offices, which is just to the side here. You'll see a sign right outside, which just says prayer, pre-gathering prayer. And it's just open for, from 8 to 8.45. And it's kind of drop-in. Come in. There's couches set up and chairs. And there'll be people in there. And it's not going to be heavily guided. We want you to get in the rhythm of getting with people, sitting before God, and not rushing it. Listening taking time to stop and breathe deep, maybe open up scripture or a a blank sheet of paper and say, God, I'm here and I'm about to worship you, but I don't even know if I'm on focus. God, I'm inviting you to speak to me and writing down those things, leaving them there on the table so that we as a church that week, our community, our team can be praying over those things that God begins to show you. Uh, Would you commit if not every week, if you come at 11, would you commit to once a month changing your schedule up and getting here? Why? And and then at the end of that little time, whoever's in the room, just praying one for another, praying for our church. He said, well, it just sounds kind of simple, almost 
boring. Friends, it's the small things that make the dramatic difference. Small practice becomes daily practice. So we want to practice that together. Communities, uh, we, we've talked about since day one of the church, uh, we, we gather together and we have more than 40 some odd that meet all over the place. And we want to, we want to grow in relationship to one another. And somebody say, Jose, can you just stop talking about that? I've been there, I've done that, and I threw out my t-shirt. Not very interested, and it may work for some, it, it doesn't work for me. I just want to answer some of the questions that we have around community life. Uh, some of them meet once, a, uh, twice a month, some of them meet every week. They meet just about every day of the week at different times. Are, are, they, are they perfect? Are they the, the solution? No. Uh, gathering together in someone's home is not a perfect scenario, but I'm not a perfect person. And so I have to come with an honest attitude that says, it's not going to be the catch-all to do everything, but church has to be more than 700 people in a room. Are communities convenient? Definitely not. They're not. This is my sales pitch. <laughs> but is that, is that our ultimate goal? We have convenience stores. We have stores that are smaller and closer that charge more because people know you're willing to go there and pay twice as much because the other one's a mile down the road and it'll be a longer line. And that's just the culture we live in. We've got to fight this desire for convenience and say maybe other people matter. And maybe it's not always about me, but maybe I'm there for someone else's good. Some days, community, when you're together, it's life-giving. Life -giving. Other days, it's a chore. But you never know, and here's the trick, you never know when God's going to use you. And you never know when God's going to use someone else in your world. So you either avoid it or you choose to step in honestly. Are our communities going to meet all your needs? Definitely not. We look to Jesus. Jesus is the one who meets our need. Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is the one who has it all. But we recognize Jesus surrounded himself with 12 people Young, different, eclectic group. One of them turned against him. And he had an intimate, deep bond with, with Peter, James, and John with three. So catch this. God chooses to walk on planet Earth. And Jesus does the will of his Father perfectly. And he's rarely alone. Sometimes he gets alone to pray. But for the most part, Jesus is with his community doing the will of the Father if God chooses to live in community, what does that say about life in God? Now, I am not suggesting that everyone's got it together. As a matter of fact, I've been a part of community life. Just about all of my following of Jesus, no group is perfect or even great. But they can be real and they can be life-giving. And they can be a place for you to grow in serving someone else rather than just looking for convenience. So there's room for more of Jesus working, not only in us, but through us together. Finally, and the last one uh, is, I think there's room this year for more of Jesus working beyond us. Like way beyond what, just what we can ever do as one local church. We're one local church of many in our city. But we know that Jesus is always making room for people who are far from God. That's Jesus' like his, it's his way of living. Other people want to eat. Jesus finds the person, the woman, at a well and is willing to offer her life. Everyone's busy to get to the next meeting and Jesus stops and says, who touched my robe? I felt power go through me. Everyone wants to be with their group and then Jesus is willing to go home uh, to the home of someone who's not a Jew. And in Jesus' culture, uh, Jews kept to themselves to keep themselves holy but when there's a Roman soldier who says, my servant's ill, Jesus says, okay, game on, I'll go. And even before he gets there, everything is made well. You see, Jesus is willing to be inconvenienced for the good of other people. And we want to pray, and I pray that Jesus will move, not just working in us and through us here, but way beyond what we can ever imagine. And in what ways? Again, big picture. Personal witness. We want to resource you. I recognize that you love Jesus, but sharing Jesus with other people, it's a little scary. 
and, and articulating your faith in our world that seems to be looking down more and more on the way of Jesus, it can be a struggle. But this year, we want to see you have all the tools that you need to know the basics of what it means to follow Jesus. We're never going to know it all. I've been in this for a while. I'm still learning every week. You think, you think I know this when I get up here. I get the joy of spending all week figuring out what this text is saying. And then I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But I'm discovering every day. So you don't have to know it all to be used of God. You just need to know Jesus. But we want to give you, and, and in this coming year, we're going to resource you with videos and tools and curriculum. All of those things are not going to replace you spending time with God. But we want to give you what you need to be a witness uh, to Jesus. Uh, citywide evangelism. Uh, we're a witness in the city. And so I think Steve mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. But we've been praying for a long time, and I just really, this May, in a very profound experience with Brandon, when we were in Uganda, actually, I, I sense that now's the time for us to up the game. And so came back, and I've met with a bunch of church leaders here, and we're going to do, by faith, we don't have an exact date. I wanted it by today. We're just waiting for the hops to confirm their schedule with the major leagues to do a big citywide outreach right at the stadium just down the street from us next summer, end of July or early August. And you say, oh, there's a lot of, that's a big place. If you look here, like, we're going to look so small. Well, whoa, it's not for us. We're going to host as a church an opportunity for churches all over the west side of the Portland metro area to invite people to come out and to worship and share the gospel and invite people to experience life in Jesus. We're not just here for us. I'll tell you right now, we're going to pay for most of it. And I'm elated because we want to invest in the good of all the churches in the city, and we want everyone in the city to hear the voice of Jesus saying, I love you, and I invite you, come and be a part of life that's really life. We believe that this is what a local church t can do, but we're, we're also doing church planning. We're, we're, we're about, you know, almost six years old. We've already helped plant churches in Estonia, in Uganda, Raleigh, North Carolina, Spokane, Washington, Bend, Oregon, San Diego, all in the first five years. We're just getting started. We're a church that believes that other churches need to be planted so they can grow and thrive and be a witness in their city. But there's room for more. There's just room for more. And so all of the world, Western world, but growing outside of the Western world, all of the world is living on a device. And, and much of life is just happening here. And we're realizing that God's doing something here. And so we're starting to capture this all on video. And because the world is on its phone, we want to be where people are. Jesus goes to where people are. He doesn't wait for them to come to him. So we're going to continue to do this. But we're going to leverage what God's teaching, showing us, growing us here. And we're going to take it to the world starting with a video podcast this week, moving out towards social media and free and easy to network into channels. There are parts of the world where, where, where broadcasting by television will be seen by millions and millions. I'm saying I see the day very, very soon where we'll, we'll be a church of whatever size here that's reaching millions of people where they're at every single day of the week. And it's right around the corner, and it's not far off, and it's not as expensive as you think, but it takes faith and capacity to believe that God wants to do more than Hillsborough and Beaverton and, and this metro area. I love our part of the city, but there are seven to eight billion people in the world, and guess what? One local church can make a billion person difference, if we'll believe it. If we'll believe it. Now, some of you are like, I got the clappers and I got the mm, yeahers. So can I just say this? God's vision is bigger than we can imagine. And that's what we want to remind ourselves of today. God's vision for your life is bigger. God's vision for this church is bigger. God's vision for that baby's bigger. God's vision for the city's bigger. God's vision for the church is bigger. God's vision is big and our minds get so small. And so we want to say, again, as a church, we can have and are having a global difference and we can only do that together. I can't do that, but we can. So going back to the beginning, there's room for more. There's room for more. It starts with desire. The life of faith 
is that we listen to the little things that God is saying, the little things that God is saying right now, and we take steps of obedience. So there may be one thing that was said this morning that grabs a hold of your heart. Remember, growth starts with desire. And all I wanted to do today was to speak to your desire and to ask your desire, is it ready for more? Therefore, the beginning of Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, do you want more? Do you even want more? Because if you don't, don't be surprised when you don't get anything because you weren't expecting. More of Jesus working in and through and beyond you. Okay, so let's assume you do. Here's the harder question. Are you willing to make room for more? Now, what do we do? We, we invite the Holy Spirit because I can't apply any of the text to your soul but the Spirit of God can take the truth of God and make it very personal to you. So we want to open our hearts to God's desires and to ask the Spirit of God to help us chip through our, our predetermined way of thinking. We'll get to that in two weeks. You have a predetermined way of thinking that's been shaped by the culture and your surroundings, your education, and some of it's off. It's not the heart of God. It's not the mind of God. So God is going to now begin this season to chip away at our thinking so that we can get into God's way of thinking. And when I'm in God's rhythm of thinking, no wonder that's where joy is. Joy is in God. And you can walk in his rhythm if you choose to. So let's invite the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite you to stand if you would now. 